Hello, Keith Kaiser here with another study in the book of Acts. We're looking at Acts 17, and once more we pick it up at verse 16, Acts chapter 17 and verse 16. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw the city was given over to idols. Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. And so we see, again, Paul's methodology, where there's a Jewish community, he makes a beeline for them. He goes to the synagogue. He seeks out the Jews. Why? Because they're his people. Ethnically, he's the Jew. And that's his religious background. So he understands them. And also, because in the pattern of salvation, or in God's program of salvation, better said, it's to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. In other words, the Jews were the first people God promised to send his son, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the Gentiles are kind of Johnny-come-latelys to it. Now, thank God for it. It's the grace of God, because neither Gentile nor Jew deserves to be saved. We deserve judgment. We deserve the wrath of God for all the sins we've committed, all the wrong we've said and done and thought, and even the good that we've left undone. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth that not, to him it is sin, First John tells us. And so we have this tremendous salvation offered through the Lord Jesus Christ. And this gospel goes first to Israel because they were the people that had the scriptures, that had the promises, that had the covenants. As Deuteronomy 7 reminds us, not because they were the greatest and mightiest of peoples, but because God set his love on them and in grace saved them. He picked that nation to be a light unto the other nations, to be a beacon, a sort of spiritual lighthouse, if you will, to attract others to their Messiah. And in the Old Testament, you get pictures of different Gentiles coming to faith in Israel's God. We think of Rahab in Jericho, or Ruth the Moabitess, who came with her mother-in-law Naomi, and who said, don't entreat me to leave you. Your God will be my God, and your people will be my people, and where you die, there I will die. And later you have other Gentiles like Uriah the Hittite, who so faithfully served David, though his faithfulness, unfortunately, was requited with betrayal and murder. In any case, in many times in the Old Testament, Gentiles were attracted to the God of Israel and came for salvation, and God saved them on the ground of Israel. They had to become part of Israel to attach themselves to Israel to be saved. But in the New Testament, it's not any national identity that saves one. It is receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, they had to receive him by faith in the Old Testament too. They were looking forward to the one God would send, to the one who would be the seed of the woman who would pay for human sin. But we now look back to the Lord Jesus who has come. The Lord Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief, Paul said, and we could say amen. Me too, Paul. I'm just the same. I needed a Savior, and the Lord Jesus is that Savior. So Paul goes to the Jews here and begins to witness to them, and also to the God-fearers, to those devout people who, though they were ethnically Gentilic, nevertheless they were interested in the God of Israel. And so he goes and reasons with them, it says. The gospel is a reasonable message. It appeals to man's intellect because it is based in what God has told us. It is propositional, in other words. It's not just how I feel or what appeals to me or my opinion. This is not a subjective religion. This is a faith based on how God has revealed himself. It's based on facts, based in history, based on how reality actually is. And so Paul and the other apostles, as we go through Acts, we see them reasoning with people entreating them to come to the Lord. And the Lord himself is reasonable. God is the one who says, Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. That's in Isaiah 1. And it was originally written to 8th century B.C. Israel. And God reasoning with them and imploring them to turn from their sin, to repent and put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here... Paul begins with those. But it also says he was in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Now, the marketplace, the Greek word is agora, 
and we use it in English today for people that are afraid of crowds and to be out in public. We say they are agoraphobic. Well, the agora was a place of not only commerce and buying and selling, but it was also a place of ideas and a place of meeting people and of discussion and sort of a center of civic activity and cultural engagement. And so Paul goes where the people are and he begins fishing for men as we can apply that activity to him here. And he begins talking with people there and among them we see that it says in verse 18, then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him and some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And so he meets people that are different. These aren't religious people according to Judaism. They're not even your standard idolaters. Epicureanism and Stoicism are two kinds of philosophies, which again were competitors, were we might say adversaries, that you weren't going to be uh, both of these things simultaneously. You were going to pick one school of thought or the other. You were going to adhere to the teachings of one group or the other. But much like the Sadducees and the Pharisees of the Jews of old, that these people, though opposed on other areas of belief and doctrine, they unite in thinking that the gospel is nonsense. They reject it. And indeed, unbelief makes strange bedfellows. You can see groups that are opposed on other things, but they agree about this. We don't want this man to reign over us. We don't want Jesus. Thank you very much. We won't have any of him. And so listening to his emissary to Paul, they say, what's this babbler going to say? They make fun of him. That's amazing because Paul was a well-educated, extremely literate man. He was erudite and he was philosophically trained and he was, of course, uh, one with a tremendous mind, one of the great minds in all of history. He had been educated not only in the best yeshiva that the Jews had, the best religious seminary or school, but he had also obviously had a classical education because in different epistles that he writes and also in this very passage, he shows that he's familiar with the Epicurean and Stoic worldviews. And he quotes different writers of the time period that engage with these ideas. And he makes a philosophically reasoned argument with them. So Christianity isn't against the life of the mind. Believers uh, were often very educated and very intelligent people. And Christianity isn't about checking your brain at the door. It's about your mind being fully engaged. As someone described Lloyd-Jones's preaching, they said it was a logic on fire. Well, that's how Christians are to be, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We are to use our brains, whatever gray matter the Lord has given us, whatever capacity we have for thought and reason, we are to lay that at the feet of the Lord and say, Lord, uh, by faith, I want to develop these tools you've given me, these things in our skill set for the glory of God. I want to bear witness to the living Christ within me, the Christ who lives in us by his spirit. And that's what Paul did with these people, even though he was greeted with um, ridicule and rebuke. And so they thought, you know, this guy's just a silly babbler. And other people thought he was sort of a religious peddler, a proclaimer of foreign gods, they said. And they didn't really understand the gospel he was preaching because they made a distinction between Jesus and the resurrection, the anastasis, as it is in Greek. And they thought that was another kind of a god, another name for a god. And so they didn't understand his message. But happily, they gave him an opportunity to explain himself further in verse 19. They took him and brought him to the Areopagus. Uh, this is often translated Mars Hill because Ares is the Greek name for Mars, who's the Greek and Roman god of war. Mars in Latin, Ares in Greek. And he comes to Mars Hill here, which is kind of like the Supreme Court of philosophy and religion. And they decide what they're going to tolerate, what ideas are dangerous in the public square, and need to be excluded or what's legitimate. 
and uh, they're kind of like a cross between uh, university and also maybe Oprah Winfrey nowadays in pop culture, you know, that they just get together and discuss something new, so tell her to hear some new thing, as it says in verse 21. So they say, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak, verse 20, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or hear some new thing. Sadly, as we see, uh, many of these folk were like those that the epistles later refer to. And it says of them in 2 Timothy 3 that they're ever learning but never coming to a knowledge of the truth. It's good to seek for knowledge. It's good to seek for the truth. But, you know, if we're unwilling to kind of arrive at the truth and put the truth in the practice, if we're unwilling to obey the truth, well, then we just kind of flounder in a relativistic sea of think so, maybe so, hope so, could be. And so many people I've met are like that nowadays, that they're so open to ideas, they're open to everything. You know the old adage that if someone doesn't stand for something, they will fall for anything. Well, it's especially true when it comes to the matter of ultimate reality and of truth. That if we don't repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, if we don't receive him who is the truth, we will be lost. There are a lot of competing ideas. There are a lot of other gospels. But the Bible says they are false gospels. There are other Christs, but they are false. The Christ of the Bible, the historical Jesus, who is revealed in the gospels and the epistles to us, he is the real a savior come from God. He's the one who fulfills the prophecies that over thousands of years were uttered in the Old Testament to prepare the world for his coming. And so if we don't bow the knee to him, uh, we're going to fall prey to error. And of course, we see that's a indicator of the last days. That Second Timothy again says that in the last days, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And later in 2 Timothy 4, it says that people are going to turn away from the truth and they will be turned to fables. So if you turn away from the truth, there's no alternative truth. There's no other truth out there. The truth is in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in God's word that speaks of him. And if we don't bow to that truth, we're going to be deluded. We're going to be deceived. We're going to fall into error and will be blinded by the God of this world, even Satan, who's the father of lies and an arch deceiver. Certainly don't want that to happen. We want to be those who genuinely seek after the truth. The Lord Jesus Christ said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And the problem is the very people he said that to in John chapter 8 immediately said to him, what do you mean we'll be free? Uh, we've never been in bondage to anyone. Now you talk about self-delusion. These people at that very moment were living under the times of the Gentiles. In other words, Israel wasn't politically free. They were uh, among many uh, subjugated peoples of the world of that time who were under the heel of Rome. They were under the rule of the Caesars and of their regime. And so they weren't free. They weren't free politically. They certainly weren't free spiritually because apart from the saving work of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are slaves to sin. And that bondage ultimately will lead to spiritual death. It will lead us to eternal perdition if we don't repent of it. In other words, we'll be lost and cast out of God's presence into hell if something is not done to break the chains of sin, if something isn't done to save us. Well, thankfully, something has been done. It's through Jesus and the resurrection. The resurrection is not another God. There's one God, and he has revealed himself through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who rose again from the dead. He's been declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, Romans 1, 4 says. So the resurrection vindicates the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, yes, he is really son of God. He is really the incarnate God who came amongst us and who offered himself as the Lamb of God to pay for our sins. He died on the cross for our sins and rose again to give us eternal life. That if we'll turn from sin and our independence of God and cry out to him to save us, 
the Lord says, whosoever calleth on the Lord shall be, on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so if we come unto him by faith, he will in no wise cast us out. By no means will we be denied or turned down. He will save us. Come to him today if you never have. And if you do know him, rejoice in him, worship him, thank him, and tell others about him. Thank you for listening.